Isaiah chapter 35. give you a moment to find that, Isaiah chapter 35. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come, he will come with vengeance. With divine retribution, he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow, and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there but only the redeemed will walk there, and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. This is the word of the Lord. So, my friends, we've entered the season of Advent, a season of waiting, a season of hope. Waiting, not just for Christmas Day, but waiting like all the people of God have waited for the dawning of the kingdom of God through all the ages. Symbolically behind me, when Philip lit the two candles, we're waiting for the next two to be lit, and then we're waiting ultimately for the white candle in the middle to be lit, the fifth candle symbolizing the incarnation, the coming of Jesus at Christmas. But of course, not just his coming at Christmas, but what we're waiting for now, his coming at the end of time, which the Bible speaks of in power (coughs) and glory. The best, however things may look, the best is always yet to come even if we don't get to see it in our lifetime. And I'm just imagining that celebration tonight in Kojic down the road in Berry Park. There'll be up to a thousand Christians all there worshipping together. And the one thing that characterises all of us who go there tonight will be this anticipation, this hope, this holy waiting, this desperate waiting. The kingdom of God is coming and is coming towards us, making us its way towards us in a town where there is so much hopelessness and despair. We hold out hope on behalf of those who have lost hope. For a seven-year-old, it might mean little more than waiting for your present on Christmas Day. For a 14-year-old, it might mean, you know, waiting until you find a boyfriend or a girlfriend or get your GCSE marks in or whatever. For a 24-year-old, it might wait, be waiting to see what your education leads to, what kind of job you get. It might be looking for a life partner. 
by the time you're 35, you'll be hit up to your neck in your career and your family, quite possibly, as I was. Uh, and by the time you're 62, <laughs> as I am, you're actually starting to think, well, I'm not really waiting for anything in particular anymore. <laughs> other than to ask the question, I wonder what kind of world I will leave behind me when my days here on Earth are numbered. So I'm waiting to see what signs um, are coming, I'm seeing, what signs I'm, I'm laying hold of around me that suggest that the, that the generation that's going to come after me will see things that I've been praying for and waiting for all my life but didn't live to see. Do you see what I'm saying? Waiting for that kingdom. And, and Anna in the temple, who's 84, uh, and Simeon, uh, who you know, was about that age too, they had been praying and waiting all their lives and they were graced with seeing Jesus brought to them in the temple like that. So we build a future together that we may or may not live to see. Um, when Margaret and I arrived in Glasgow in 1980, we'd heard about how there'd been the gorbels, the terrible slums of Glasgow, which had all disappeared. They'd been there you know, all the way through, and by, the, I think, 1970 or so, uh, they'd gone. Generations of faithful Christian Glaswegians have worked through that those slums will be cleared, yeah? And in our time, in our 12 years in Glasgow, we saw an area called Mary Hill, completely transformed by the same kind of action, you know, poverty, alcoholism, too many pubs, uh, filthy, dirty, dangerous canals, all kind of tidied up, and a new civic pride coming in. Over that period, we lived to see that in that area. And I just heard the news uh, uh, before the service from um, Helen Curtis that they've, they reckon now that they're going to have enough money to buy the Butte Mills place. And, uh, apparently a quarter of a million pounds has just come in from one benefactor. <laughs> this is just so exciting. You know Butte Mills, it's that wonderful... Um, building that stands, when you come out of the train station in Luton, you see it there in front of you, this tall, square building. That building, we, we, we believe now, because the money's there to buy it, that building is going to become a beacon for the Christian witness, the gospel, in the centre of Luton for generations to come. And Chris Curtis and his team won't just see, live to see all the fruits of that, but some of you little kids have just walked in the door right now. We'll live to see that, you know. And in 20, 30, 40, year, 50 years' time, that place will have been a huge blessing, not, to the young not just to the young people of Luton and Bedfordshire, but to the whole of the country. Now, that's only happened because crazy people like Chris Curtis have believed under God this might be possible to raise a million pounds. They need another one and a half to refurbish it, but what's that? So, yeah, waiting, a holy desperation that the kingdom of God is moving towards us. What can I do to help it come? Yeah? Think of the Israelites in, the, in, in Egypt. They were there 430 years, generation after generation. I wonder how many of them had hope that one day they would see a promised land. Probably most of them died in despair and hopelessness, but some of them would have kept the faith, the promises given to Abraham. And then, even then, they were led out of Egypt, you know, by Pharaoh, 40 years in the wilderness, moaning, groaning, desperate, probably most of them having lost hope and thinking Moses was a nutter. And then even Moses doesn't get to make it into the promised land, and very few of them who had left Egypt actually make it there. Roll on in, in Hebrew history to the time of the exile in 6th century BC in Babylon. 70 years they were out there. Only some of them who'd gone there as young people would have seen the new Jerusalem when they came back in 539 BC. Only some of them would have got to see that. 
but many others, like Isaiah, who I just read, holding out hope on behalf of his people who'd all but lost hope. And go to the end of your Bible in the book of Revelation. Here we have uh, John writing from his penal colony in Patmos to a group of hard-pressed Christian churches in what is now was then called Asia, is now Turkey. All those seven churches out there, hard up against it, persecution from the Roman empires, thrown to the lions, lo losing their jobs because of their, their Christian witness. Hard up against it, but John writing to them the words of hope from the throne of heaven itself. Even if you are lose your faith and you are sorry, use your life and you are martyred because of your faith, even then it doesn't actually matter because the best, the best will all is always yet to come. Remain strong. The second death will not snatch you away. You will follow Jesus into his resurrection eternal life. Hope. And the pattern is always the same. I think this is what the pattern is. That when there are a people walking in darkness, as Isaiah 9 says, when the people are walking in darkness, then some see a great light. And it's all the brighter be precisely because they're walking in darkness. That Butte Mills vision is so bright because, precisely because it's in a town which is so dark. The people walking in darkness have seen a bright light. Vision born through tough times. Hope crystallizing when the situation seems, humanly speaking, hopeless. And it's into that world that Jesus was born. Judaism, the religion of the Jews at that day, had become... It turned in against itself. The prophetic voice had been silent for about 300 years. The religious leaders were the Pharisees, and they'd reduced the, Christ the faith down to a whole pile of laws, of don'ts, yeah? It had been frozen solid. And if that, although that, as though that weren't enough, the Romans, the, the dominant power of the day, were controlling, trying to control everything. That's why they had the census, to try and control who was being born and who lived everywhere in the country. The census of Caesar Augustus at the time of the birth of Jesus that you read about in Luke 1, Luke 2. And then you see Caesar Augustus is such an interesting figure. Do you know, he spoke about the gospel his version of the gospel, it's the same word he used, euangelion, which means gospel, good news. His version of the gospel was this. On the day I, Caesar Augustus, was born, a blessing was promised to the whole world because I am God. And when Luke and the other evangelists took this word, gospel, euangelion, good news. When they took that word gospel, they were taking a word that was already around, being used by people like Caesar Augustus to say, I am the greatest thing ever. Just look to me and all will be well. You will have the Pax Romana, the wonderful Roman peace all across the whole known world. And of course, what happened? It all ran into the sand. That great empire that looked like it was omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, ran into the sand. Even Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. Thousands of, uh, 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 of people crucified on crosses. But not that long after that, the Roman Empire collapsing, as every human empire will collapse. But the gospel, Luke, <laughs> captures it so beautifully. The real, the real good news became incarnate in the womb of a, a little teenage peasant girl when she was sitting in her room in Nazareth. Jesus was born of Mary. And the good news, a 
appears in the darkness in the weakest, darkest, most marginalized places of earth. And here we are today, keeping the story alive. So the temptation and the great danger with this business of desperate waiting and desperate hoping, the great danger for all of us all the time, every generation, is that we hope for the wrong things. We hope, put our hope in political parties. We put our hope in our family tree. We put our hope in our insurance policy. Uh, we put our hope in Christchurch. I mean, by that I mean the building and the institution, the PCC. We put our hope in, in that. We might even put our hope in the vicar or the one to come. But if you put your hope in anything other than the Lord who made heaven and earth, as the psalm says, if you put your hope in anything else than the Lord and his kingdom, you will be hoping in the wrong thing and your hopes will be dashed. And your dashed hopes will turn to cynicism which is usually manifesting gossip and murmurings. And your cynicism, in some cases, will turn to despair. And sometimes it may even turn to suicide. In what precisely are we hoping? What is our holy desperation about? Is it holy? Is it holy? Or are we hoping for the wrong things? And if we do that, I hope that the church I was in last church would have its pews taken out and new, new seats put in. It was the wrong thing to hope for. I knew it at the time, but I hadn't really grasped it deeply in my heart that we have to wait, like Simeon and Anna waited in the temple, for the coming of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Messiah, and his kingdom. No other kingdom. So we hope. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the deers of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsting ground, bubbling springs in the haunts where jackals once lay. Grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. This is the hope. And a highway will be there and it will be called the way of holiness. So we're learning to become a holy people. We are a holy people, but we're learning to become more holy by setting ourselves apart, being set apart from a world that is hoping and longing and putting its energy into the wrong things that won't bring life. hoping for the kingdom of God to be realized ever more fully. Do you realize, folks, that there are signs of this happening right here in this room now? Just one sign, but an important, significant sign. The belief, the simple belief that every single one of us are equal in the sight of God Every single one of us equally made in his image. How is that manifest? That is manifest by the fact that we have black people actually wanting to worship with white people. White people actually wanting to worship with black people. We cannot take this for granted. This is a sign of the dawning of the kingdom of God. And when this happens, as it's happened in this very gentle way this morning, I don't want to overstate it because I'll prick the bubble. <laughs> when this happens, God releases spiritual power and energy. People who had been oppressed people who are oppressed must be intentionally lifted up. Margaret and I went to see um, a film called Butler. Have you seen this film? Do try to get to see it. We think it may come to Luton. Where did we see it? Susan? Stevenage, right? This wonderful film called Butler, which is about the civil rights movement in America. <coughs> 
And it goes right back um, into the life of this young black boy who was work working, I suppose, in the cotton fields. And he witnesses his, his father being shot by his white overlord in, in the head, in front of his eyes. He grows up, this young man, and it traces all the oppression of the black people, all the marginalization, and all the details of that very, very, very powerfully. And eventually he, the, he gets a job as the butler of the President of the United States of America. Such a beautiful story. And he's President to Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Carter, Reagan, Clinton, I probably haven't got them in the right order. He's president, he's butler for all of those presidents. And through that time, it's the whole race, um, you know, it's the whole race agenda. It's the civil rights movement uh, with huge numbers of deaths and shootings and trouble right across the country. But he lives to see the day when he is taken in by the new butler, because he's now too old, He's taken in by the new butler, a bright, shining young black man, to see the president of the United States, Obama, a black man. This man, the butler, from his childhood, when he's seen his dad shot, lives in hope that one day the kingdom of God will dawn. And he actually lives to see that in this particular way. And, and of course... By and large, that's an issue that's been dealt with now, hasn't it, in America and in our country? You know, we don't have a problem with that anymore. It's not as though we've got two different toilets, one for black people and white people, as they had in there. Let's remember that. Let's flag that up, because that's gone now. But we do have in our midst one Roma person this morning who is suffering similar marginalisation, children being beaten up at school. Another one of her community had his, his van set on fire outside his house in, in Houghton Regis on Thursday morning at one o'clock when he was sleeping in his house by masked gangsters. And later that same day, a whole load of guys, six big men, turned up at his house to drag his family out of the house and take them off. We've now set up policemen outside the house every day. We can't rest. We may have dealt with the issue of oppression of black people. We may have dealt with the issue of uh, the marginalization of ha and hatred of Jewish people to some extent, but we've yet to deal with it with gypsies, travelers, and Romans. And others. We have to carry on. Holding out hope on their behalf. Even when they've lost hope. So what do we do? We do what we've done this morning. We create a holy space, and a highway will be there, verse 8 of chapter 35 of Isaiah. And a highway will be there, and it will be called the way of holiness, and it will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. This is this place. This is what we're here for, to create a place, almost like a kind of kingdom of God social experiment where we can see can we actually do this to what extent can we create a holy space where every kind of sin is not allowed inside when we're on our staff retreat <coughs> we had a picture of Christchurch as pillars like this right but open spaces between the pillars where people were free to come in, but equally free to go. Yeah? Free to come in, free to go. In the middle, a holy space. To force anybody to come in would be a denial of the vision itself, wouldn't it? To kick people out. <laughs> We've never done it yet, but uh, it's not kind of attuned to the, the vision, is it? But what we're trying to do at Christchurch, this is, this is the vision you don't need a five-year plan. It's ever so simple. Trying to create a holy space where everybody's equally valued. Whatever their background, where there is pure speech and holy listening. 
a safe place. There will be no lion there, nor any ravenous beasts will be found there. What are the equivalents of the lions and the ravenous beasts? Legalism. You're not holy enough. You need to become more like me. That's a ravenous lion, isn't it? Any form of legalism. Let's say no to that. And the redeemed will walk there, and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter with Zion with singing. Listen to the singing this morning. Beautiful singing. Joyful singing. Mm. Kingdom of God singing. Not just rolling out another, another hymn for the sake of it. And songs chosen by the people, not just imposed by the worship leader. Safe place. And in the middle of the holy place, we enthrone Jesus. Our role model. Laid in a manger. Humility. Nailed to a cross. Willing to suffer. Exalted on high. Seated at the right hand of the Father. Our hope in the one who is and was and is to come. Who is. This is really important, this bit, folks. He is. He is. He's already here. Our hope is already fulfilled. He is here. We live this side of the birth of Jesus. He is God with us. He is Emmanuel. He is with us. We live this side of the cross of Jesus. We are forgiven, ransomed, healed. We live this side of the resurrection of Jesus. Death has lost its sting. Hey, guys, he is here. So you see, we don't need to be social activists. You know, we don't need to half kill ourselves with secular social activism, activism which is rooted in the kingdom of the world, because that will only lead us into cynicism and despair. He is here. So there is a profound sense in which we already have everything we need to do kingdom of God stuff. We have everything we need. We have a living Lord in our midst who is and who is to come. We set our eyes on the horizon of the future, knowing that whether every knee likes it or not, or whether every tongue likes it or not, every knee will bow and confess that he's Lord, says Paul in Philippians 2. Every knee will bend and confess ultimately that he is Lord, and every tongue ultimately will confess that he's Lord. We don't know quite how that will be, but that is the prophecy. We pass the baton on in faith to the next generation, knowing that we not, may not be the actual one who passes the finishing line. The butler in the film saw the President of the United States come as a black man. He got to see that. His, his father, who was killed, didn't get to see that. The hope is passed to the next generation. Only some of us see, get to see what we've been praying and working for. And if all that is true, then we can be at peace and yet still yearn and still be active. We drink of a cup of salvation. We drink the cup of salvation knowing that the best wine will come at the end. Amen.